thanks a million for coming, everybody. Um, uh, we've got Brian after a while, and, and that's really the bread and butter of, of this presentation, for want of a better word. Um, but for the next 20 minutes or so, what I'd like us to do is maybe think a little bit wider than just the carbs, the protein, the fat. And this is really about having a think of how we come to something in terms of nutrition and where our ideas lie and how our ideas can be influenced. And I think very much as coaches um, and as players, that's very important, but particularly from a coaching point of view, because you do influence um, the players that you look after. <coughs> so what I'm going to do um, for the next little while is have a look at maybe <clears throat> some examples even from yourself of what they might be. So if we can think about things now, it's January, there's loads of them floating about, I'm sure. Um, exploring some of the sources of the information that, we're, uh, that we are fed and um, how we, I suppose, interpret that. Drivers for some of these individuals, which I think is very important. Your role in education and just a little bit around some work we've done, which maybe some of you participated in um, through the questionnaire we sent out last year. Um, some simple alternatives or just applying that to um, the, the food groups or the food that we have. And then what I'd like us to do then is see how we can apply that and maybe some questions for Brian in terms of you know, difficulties that you may have experienced, how we can maybe um, broach some of those areas. So between the two of us, hopefully, you'll be able to go away with some um, uh, answers to questions. So I'm going to make you do a wee bit of work. Do you think there's any mixed messages out there or myths when it comes to food and nutrition? Anybody want to throw one up? You're confused. Brilliant. That's that, uh, you're not on your own. I'm confused too. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. But yes, yeah, so you're confused. You don't know what to do. Anybody watch that sugar crush on Monday last? Sports yeah, okay. Well, that's good if it's cleared that up. But I think I got a text after that and somebody said to me, I actually don't know what to eat now. Yeah. Would anybody? Yeah? Would that? So that's a good example of... And this, for me, was a good one. Anybody see this? Yeah? yeah. I, I read the paper and I thought, that can't be right. Uh, but the point is, it's there. We open the news, we open the media, we look at it. So last week's news was, black pudding is the new superfood for 2016. Happy days. Isn't that right? <laughs> we thought, this, this year can't get any better. It's definitely on, it's on the up in January. So we look at this and we think, yeah, it is good for you. It's a staple of our greasy breakfasts. So I, I actually looked at it and I thought, this, can't, this definitely can't be right. But in my mind, I actually questioned myself as well. Is there something I've missed? Do I need to? So we are all, everybody's in this together. So I think it is. And then a few days later, the examiner said it's actually a ruse. The people that actually... That where it came from was um, a, a website called musclefuel.com. Uh, <clears throat> it's not my first scientific publication that I would go to. But what they did was they actually um, questioned some of their readers, and it was through opinion rather than actually true science. So this had been taken and interpreted some other way, so it actually there was no basis behind it at all. And if we look at then maybe the argument against it, well, yes, it does have a good source of iron and it potentially might is a good source of protein. But the difficulty that we have is it's also very high in salt. It's high in saturated fat. And some of the guidance in terms of, say, the WHO for reducing processed meats, particularly in an attempt to avoid cancer. So this is one thing. Yes, we can get these nutrients in it, but there are probably better ways. It's like the story around Jaffa cakes. I'm sure we've had that one as well in terms of a good source of carbohydrate. Yes, it is. But when I try and deliver an information piece around carbohydrate, I try it and do it in such a way that we can actually get a food that maybe does more than one thing. So if I have a banana, let's say, it will give me carbohydrate, it will give me um, fiber, it will give me vitamins and minerals. So that's important to remember too. So, we have to remember, newspapers do want to sell stories. This will sell a story. 
and, and you know, wine is good for you, that sells a story. Chocolate is good for you, today it's coffee is good for you. These are all things that we like. So we're, we're burning into the psyche of, of things that is positive in our... On the flip side, scientific journals are actually almost the same. They want to sell their paper and their story. So we have to remember that sometimes there are bad science, for want of a better word, or there's a spin on it. And it's people like ourselves that hopefully can take that bias out of something and give you the information that you need. They don't publish negative results. So if something shows that it, there's no effect, you probably won't see it. And again, this is a really important one. Conflicts of interest based on funding sources. So again, that is becoming a lot more prevalent. And when you publish, you have to um, basically put in any potential conflicts of interest as a scientist you might have as well. So that's, that's a positive step forward going forward for the public. Detox, what about detox? Have we heard this one? Yeah, everybody's detoxing January. That's what we do really. It's a buzzword in the health and beauty world. Um, the idea behind this is because from time to time we need to clear out the system. We need to get rid of all the stuff that's floating about and, and hasn't been good for us. Um, and again, you know, after Christmas, it's a particularly good time to potentially put that um, message out there as well. They can last from about one day up to God knows how long, really. You know, fasting for short periods of time, that's a really popular one. Um, Juice-based diets, cleaning yourself out, something like that. Only consuming fruit and veg. You know, the message there in terms of increasing fruit and veg, not necessarily a bad one, but realistically, it's probably not the way to go forward. Usually there's some element of these to be cut out. Wheat and dairy products are probably useful ones. They tend to come to the top of everybody's list, really. Um, consuming a limited range of foods. So we do keep it quite limited. Do you notice where we're going here? If we're reducing the overall amount of food that we're consuming, and it doesn't take, we are probably going to lose weight. And most of these is based around probably how we look, our body image, and trying to reduce weight as well. Avoiding caffeine and alcohol, probably a pretty good thing. You will feel better if you're avoiding those, so that's no bad thing. And then in comes around the end, where they're offering you some kind of lotion, potion, or pill that's actually going to make it all better as well. Do we recognize some of these things out there? Yes, so again, once they start to offer you something like that, that for me is always relatively clear in terms of the warning signals. Listen, there's, um, you know, you'll have this here, but our body does detox itself. It, we have a pair of kidneys, they're very good at that. We also have a liver, and that's their job. Our skin is there to do that job as well. So we are very well set up to do that job ourselves, and it's constantly um, clearing out toxins from our system that, that does that. So, and I think it's remember, if you don't smoke, if you're not drinking alcohol, if you're getting plenty of sleep, you're actually going to feel much better anyway. So they're the primary things that we want to um, uh, focus on. So again, that myth really, many of the claims are exaggerated, not based on science, and the benefits may be very short-lived. Practically, as a practitioner, what I find is that if people go hell for leather on trying to really deny themselves everything, it usually lasts about four to six weeks. That's the usual length of time that people can focus in on something like that, and then they just say, oh, I can't be bothered with this. This isn't great at all. And they go back to doing everything that they used to do. So sometimes going for the easy wins is a better solution at the end of the day as well. And again, you know, there are some positive habits associated with this, and we can't deny that. Um, so I suppose it's taking the bits that might suit you as an individual and, and seeing how you can incorporate them into maybe some small practice changes that are much more um, sustainable. Listen, facts and fallacies and fads, they haven't been, it's not yesterday or the day before, um, it's been going on for years. There is a bit of a bandwagon effect. What are they doing? What's somebody else doing? We follow kind of trends there as well. We have a real herding instinct as humans. We like to do things that other people do as well. And, and particularly within a team sport, what's such and such a team doing? Yeah, I think we have to do that as well. So we really do follow some of those things. And that's not unusual at all. Science doesn't really matter. If there's a social 
um, aspect to this in terms of proof socially, then we probably will follow that much better as well. But remember, folks, there are no quick fixes. And I'm sure as coaches, um, you would love to take a player to a certain place. It's not going to happen today or tomorrow. Wouldn't that be right? It's going to take time. And it's the same with what we, we eat and drink. Most of our, our habits are set down very early in life. And actually, when we try to break them, it's a very difficult part, place to go to. So that's why if we can get in there early with our youngsters and make better habits easier, then it, it, it helps in the longer term. So what are the drivers? I think a big driver for us is body image. And it becomes it is becoming much more of a, a focus given our social media, our Facebooks, our Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. So, and I actually believe that this is a worrying area for, for us to go to. Um, athletes, in, in general, they're not any different to the rest of us. They do engage in inappropriate dietary practices and training st strategies in the belief that that will control their body shape and weight. And especially if you've got a coach who's driving that, maybe the coach doesn't even realize that they're saying it then that can be a very subtle effect on the athletes that we do have in front of us as well. So again, sometimes these behaviours, we're looking for the pursuit of leanness in females. So <clears throat> what you often see with female athletes is they actually don't care as long as the scales are right. And they don't seem to realise that actually with muscle, those scales may go up. And with muscle comes a better, a stronger athlete, uh, an endurance-based there and they can't seem to realize that it's not all about the scales. In interest with males, it's muscularity. So how muscular you are is very, very important in terms of a, a, a male. And I think there are um, difficulties in disassociating um, the relationship between eating appropriately. So if you've got an athlete or a player that's, consume, that's using up 5,000 calories a day, which isn't unusual, if you think about it, if you've got a player that's on a site five days a week, maybe even a sixth day, they're training twice a week, do you think 2,000 calories is going to sustain them? No. But you look, sometimes I look at their um, lunch boxes and it's not enough. And I do believe that some of this is related to some of the injuries that we're having and potentially that burnout that we're having as well. So again, the athletes perceive weight loss to be associated with reductions in food, when in fact energy availability is really important so that you can run, you can do your training, and it's not about cutting back, it's actually about eating appropriately on the days that you're training. So yes, we can look at other days within the week, but as a player, to try and lose body fat, gain muscle, and to train hard all at the same time is actually very difficult. And by the rules of human nature, do we usually give ourselves plenty of time to do that? No. We think of a championship game, we think, oh, eight weeks, we'll do that, no problem. So that's where sometimes, if we can extend it out a bit longer, give ourselves a wee bit more time to achieve our aims, be that increasing lean muscle mass or reducing body fat, that actually is, is a really important place as well. That's just to keep me awake for a couple of minutes. But <laughs> the point is, our influencers have changed, right? And this guy here, he's actually too old now. His sons, where is that? <laughs> These guys are the people that are influencing our kids. This guy has 4.2 million followers on Instagram. And this is him in the gym. So this is what our young people are actually looking towards. And I think for me, I'm not sure if he could do what we want them to do on a playing field. Do you think he could? Probably not. Probably not. So that's an important. These are our influencers. That's this week's GQ magazine. That's to keep everybody awake. OK? So my point is here that we are being bombarded. For a long time, it was females that were bombarded with these messages and images. And it has caused problems. But men and our young men are being bombarded with what we look. And a couple of years ago, I had a very interesting consult with an intercounty hurler. And his words to me were, I want to look like the guy in front of men's health. 
I had concerns over that, and I think the coach did as well. But he was, I don't think the guys in front of men's health probably could run the distances we're asking our players to run and do the training we're asking them to do on successive days for numbers of teams as well. So it is a bigger image. Image is a bigger factor now with boys than it ever was, <coughs> and men. Disordered eating behaviours. So we think of eating disorders as our anorexia and bulimia. We actually have other stranger ones that sit within that that are maybe not as, um, we don't see them as well. And one of them is this one called orthorexia, which is non-healthy obsession with healthy eating. Now that almost goes to the flip side of what we watched on Monday, where, but what that does is it fuels a little bit of that. And in a certain psyche, that actually can do harm. So we're not saying that it's a good thing to eat sugar. We're absolutely not. What, we're, what I feel is the problem is we victimized fat for 30 years. It was the bad guy. Now it's OK. Sugar is actually the devil at the moment. What will it be in a couple of more years? So it's not, it's how we put things together is the important thing to remember. And as players, it's how we put that together looking at our training week, which is very, very important as well. Okay, so I think we need to maybe think about that in a bit of a broader sense. <clears throat> this is an interesting one because this then focuses on how it takes it out of potentially into something a bit more serious. And this was a study that was done a couple of years ago with some children in America where they looked at over 5,500 males ranging between 12 and 18 years. Um, and almost 10% of them responded with concerns about their muscularity. So they didn't feel they were muscular enough, they didn't feel um, that they had gained sufficient bulk, but they didn't have any bulimic behavior, so they weren't binging um, or, or starving themselves. 2.5 the, 2 then were starting to use supplements, growth hormone der derivatives, and anabolic steroids to achieve this physique. Okay, so this is where we can actually start to go to in terms of um, driving people's decision making processes as well. Muscularity concerns are relatively common um, in young males um, and again this may drive them to unhealthy practices. And there are significant risks with that. This is an incident last year of a young Irish man who uh, went on the internet and bought himself some weight loss um, tablets and unfortunately the young man died. This is not an isolated incident. The same drug was, has killed probably somewhere in the region of 8 to 10 people over the last year between Ireland and the UK. So this stuff's not for human <coughs> consumption and certainly in, in terms of weight loss it would be one of those supplements that I would have grave concerns about in terms of some of the risks that's involved there. So I'm not making it up, but I'm also trying to make you aware that there are stuff out there that decision-making processes can be influenced and people, individuals can go to these places. So you do have a key influence on your players. Everybody's very different. So what people eat within a team might be very different. So Try and, and again, we had a coach last week that was commenting on what one individual was doing versus what another one was doing. And trying to, I suppose, say that one was better than the other. I would try and steer away, away from that as much as possible. Watch the misinformation because they are vulnerable to it. And again, there is a desire to please you as a coach. So that's important to remember as well. Attitudes are important in affecting practice, but don't let your attitudes affect your players. So again, we've had coaches who um, have very interesting practices themselves and they try and impart that to their players. It may not suit them. You might be a coach as a teacher or somebody working in an office and you've got somebody who's out in the site that's working a very energy dense, they need to consume lots of calories. And there's only so many calories when you're up on a roof that you can consume from lettuce. It's just not going to happen. So you think you have to think about the applied practicalities of where your players are as well. This is a piece of work we did last year, and if anybody was involved in it, thank you very much. Um, we questioned a wide range of different um, uh, coaches across a range of different sports. Um, and again, from that, we had 128 that completed the questionnaire in total. 
and we had just shy of 50 of those were GAA coaches. So what I want to do is just have a wee look at the GAA coaches versus the other sports. And what you'll find is it's very similar. The knowledge base in terms of your, your coaches across a range of different questions was very, very similar. The interesting one for me is when we talked, asked questions about nutritional supplements, there was a significant um, inability to answer those correctly across all coaching codes in terms of sport. And if we compare this to um, pieces of work that have been done in other countries, everybody, we're very similar in how we answer those questions, but as Irish coaches, we are lower in our ability to answer these supplement questions. So that, there's a, I suppose, a body of education required there. So what is the poor knowledge? Can anybody, now, avocados, high or low in fat? Anybody answer that one? Hi, good stuff. I should ask you guys. You would have got it all right. Cottage cheese, high or low in fat? Low. Okay. So basically, um, that's where people particularly got that one. So that's a good option for people if they're trying to get a protein source um, that's lower in fat, high in calcium, and we can flavour that up as well. So people have preconceived ideas about what cottage cheese might taste like. The following foods contain cholesterol, margarine, yes or no? No. So again, margarine is usually a vegetable source. Or, uh, so again, it was used as an alternative to our saturated butter, so um, a, a low source of saturated fat. Spinach is a good source of iron that is available to the body. It's a good source of iron. Its availability is a wee bit more difficult because it's from a, a vegetable source. So we need to ensure that we have vitamin C with that, um, excuse me, so that we can absorb it. So again, little nuances there that we need to be able to remember. So you know, if we compare, people might say, oh, you know, get rid of red meat or get rid of d a meat sources of, of iron and eat green be eat kidney beans and, and spinach. Yes, they are good sources of iron, but you'd probably need a field the same size of this of spinach to deliver the quantity of iron similar to 100 grams of red meat. Do you see what I mean? So you're not going to eat that. So you see that a lot in a lot of foods is a good source of this, is high in that, but you have to think about the quantity that you'd have to eat in that. Multivitamins, again, should be taken by most players or athletes. Yes or no? No, it w and again, it comes down to what you've got in front of you. So, but the answer probably would be no. As an athlete, you're not necessarily going to need more of these things if you get your baseline of calories right. So if you're an athlete that needs 5,000 calories, but you're only consuming 2,000, potentially we've got a problem with that as well. Creatine supplementation has more of an effect when natural body sources are, or stores are low. Yes or no? It's no, really. It'll either have an, you'll either be a responder or you'll not be a responder. So it was thought if you were vegetarian, you might have normally low creatine, creatine stores, but actually the response doesn't take really that into effect. The main performance enhancing effect of HMB is that it breaks down fat during exercise. No. So it, it basically is amino acid that um, it can be helpful in terms of um, recovery and, and it sits in around that um, training um, period or piece there as well. Caffeine enhances performance by causing the body to use fat for energy production and spare glycogen. Yes or no? This is you having to wake up today. You didn't think you were coming into this. We actually need our coffee for this one, don't we? Yes, it is one of the, the theories by which caffeine potentially works. Bicarbonate loading can provide an increased capacity to sustain high intensity, uh, high intensity exercise through the buffering of lactic acid. Yes or no? Yes, well, I think it's such a long, protracted <laughs> answer, you probably would. Yes, so basically bicarbonate works, sodium bicarbonate works by buffering um, your lactic acid, and it tends to work in those kind of sprint-type sports much more than, say... Now, does anybody know that if you take some of that, it can cause some serious dodgy guts as well? So, you know, it, it's uh, appropriate strategies as well. What about the athlete questions? You know, some of them are very intelligent questions. What body fat percentage should I be? Maybe compared to, I'm not a rugby player, I'm not a soccer player, I'm a Gaelic <coughs> footballer or a hurler. Um, how much would you eat? 
a day if you're not training? Very good question. And again, looking to adapt that to your training program. What should I eat before and after a match? Great question. Can you drink too much water? Another good one, because we're bombarded with this as well. Which is better for hydration, milk, isotonic sports drinks or water? So really good questions. And again, how I would base my education around that. Do players need protein shakes? Get that all the time. And then we've got some really good ones then in there as well. How many McDonald's can you eat in a week? So it's again the go-to place. What can I get away with? Okay. Um, how many cheat meals should I have? Okay. Are sausage rolls bad for you? No. Huh? <laughs> Were you at Jordanstown? <laughs> Are bananas toxic? Okay, so again, some of these questions just, but these are what people want to know. And what I would say is bananas aren't toxic. They have slightly more carbohydrate than other fruits. But because there's a lot of fiber there, it's actually not a bad thing. Unless it's really black, and yes, then the sugar gets in much quicker. Are sausage rolls bad for you? I don't like sausage rolls. They are my pet hate. But, you know, you could do so much better. And again, uh, but vilifying a food probably doesn't make it any easier. So again, how do you set up your week? If you eat sausage rolls every day, you stop at the garage, you get two sausage rolls, that's what you do on your way to work, then I would say potentially we can do better. And yes, maybe once a week, that's okay. So, simple strategies. This is one that probably is a very topical, common one. Whey protein, very popular strategy with players across a number of sport and codes. There is evidence to link it in terms of recovery, um, but it's not about eating a bullock at one go. It's about splitting it across the day so that you're taking small amounts of protein to help um, recover as well. And uh, amino acids are involved in muscle protein synthesis. Can everyday foods do a similar job? Can it help with recovery? Could there be other benefits? Is it cheaper? And safety obviously is important as well. So that's where probably milk comes in. Lots of different um, sources of different nutrients here, um, which we need on a regular basis. And again, can potentially fall into some of these strategies here. Rehydrate, recovery, um, refuel, because of, uh, and again, deals with some of the other issues that we asked about. And if we look at recovery here, over time, we're looking at your commercial-based recovery drinks and your low-fat milk, probably something similar as an end point, okay? And you can see that our sports drinks um, definitely will have no help in recovery. Rehydration is a different thing, but it's not going to help with recovery. And actually, water is better. So if we, go to, if we take away nothing from that, I think one of the things that we need to know is how we use our products. In hydration, you can see over a period of time how much weight a player lost or an athlete lost and how well or how long it took them to rehydrate. And you can see that after four hours that your skim milk and your skim milk with added salt actually does a better job. So yes, the sports drink will get it up, but over a period of time that lags off and that's the same with water as well. So here comes a strategy. Instead of taking sports drink and water, what about if we looked at, say, milk as a recovery strategy, a rehydration strategy, and actually is a simple food? And it, there's probably a cost benefit there too. So is there a magic bullet, do you think? I wish there was, but unfortunately there's not. Questions you need to ask, are the basics covered? So if the basics aren't right, no amount of other things are going to do it. Do you think the players are focusing on the right areas? Are they looking at their training day? Are they looking at the evening before their training day and the morning after their training day as a focus period? Are they looking at their prep for matches? Do they play a match, a club match on a, you know, a Sunday evening or a Sunday afternoon and one on a Friday as well? How are you going to legislate for recovery between the two of those? What, one size doesn't fit all. So we've got to remember that just because one of your best players is doing something, it may not fit with the other one. Watch marketing. If, you're, if they're trying to sell you something, be mindful about that. If it sounds too good to be true, unfortunately. And watch the social media as a source of information. Try and get, don't focus on one nutrient. It has to be an overall holistic approach. And be careful of your sources of information. This is a really interesting one. This guy wrote a book called Bad Science, right? 
he submitted an application for his cat um, to join the American um, Association of Nutritional Consultants. The cat was dead, um, but the cat got membership. So ha ha the dead cat is actually an accredited nutritionist. I'm just not sure who was so. Um, but so be careful, everybody can call themselves a nutritionist. You'll probably all be nutritionists after we leave here today. But for here, the INDI, they have a specialist interest group called the Sports Nutrition Interest Group. So again, they've got a website and you can access information through that. Safe Food and the Food Safety Authority of Ireland. Um, and we have a website and social media presence where we do put on recipes. We do have information up there that you may find beneficial. And the IRFU have a very good nutrition section in terms of the work um, Ruth and her team have done there. And again, if people want to go to the Australian Institute of Sport, that's very, very useful as well. This is a great resource from Safe Food. You can download it in a PDF, put it up on your own social media presence in terms of your clubs. Um, and it's a very, very useful strategy for your teenage um, athletes. And again, this is just some information that we've done up um, in conjunction with Sport Ireland as well on a range of different supplements to give you some information as well. So thanks a million. And um, I hope that wasn't um, uh, too fast. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. So. Now we're getting the real deal now. Brian's going to answer all the questions. And I think he comes with a wealth of, of information in terms of this is all the theory we've just talked about. Applying it is very different. Wouldn't you say that's right, Brian? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I suppose that's just, just as well set the scene for myself. Um, uh, I suppose Sharon is here as the nutritional expert. I suppose um, I'm here. I suppose if anyone wants to draw, I suppose my experience as an intercounty footballer for for over a decade and how I suppose navigated the nutritional maze that is out there like Sharon touched upon. So and again, I coach an underage Gaelic team, so uh, I suppose any strategies I try and implement with them as well. The floor is your guys. Any questions? Still in shock that you can't eat black pudding, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, hi. You mentioned a second ago about milk. Yeah. Or a little while ago about milk. What happens if you come across an athlete with intolerances to yeah. it? Yeah, and we've got to look at the other alternatives for milk. And, you know, there are soya-based, there's um, almond-based, there are um, rice-based. So there are alternatives. And, yes, absolutely, if you've got an athlete that's intolerant to lactose, then you've got to, um, you've got to take that into consideration. So um, the difference is usually within the profile of the actual other alternative dairy milks of amino acids, but you know, if that's in with a, a varied diet, it should be able to, you should be compensated. Remember again, make sure that there's a fortified source of calcium as well in it, because some of them are sweetened and some of them also have no calcium in them. Thank you. I suppose a question for you was any good, bad or ugly advice that you would as you as a coach wouldn't take forward when you're working with your or what was good that you would think, right, I definitely want to make sure and do that in terms of prep for food and nutrition around training? Um, I suppose, I suppose you, know, you touched on everything in, in kind of moderation. And I remember when I was a younger player, when I kind of first started playing inter-county football, um, and I was obsessed with hydration, hydration, hydration. And you know, I was, always had the bottle of water around, drinking a lot. And it got to the point where it was actually affecting my sleep. And you know, you're getting up throughout the night to obviously, to obviously go to the bathroom. And there's, I suppose there obviously is a performance benefit of being hydrated, but y you can overdo things as yeah. well. And even, I suppose, the, the carbohydrate-based diets, we were all uh, so accustomed to going back a number of years that it was, it was breads, it was pastas, it was morning, noon, and night. Um, so I suppose it's, it's kind of what you've touched on in your presentation there, I suppose, not to be, not to be fooled by the information that is out there in social media. Um, there are experts like Sharon and, and good sources of information you can go to to steer your players. Um, it's just not to be fooled by the marketing companies and things like that because they, they are very much there to, to drive products. Uh, they don't, I think, really care about the welfare of, of, of players. Any other questions? Was there, were you, did you want to ask a question? No. Um, I'm involved with a minor camogie group, so dealing with players from 15 to 18. Um, so I suppose if there was two or three key points that I might go after with a group of that age, what would you recommend? Actually, if I we wouldn't mind, I, I coach a, a kids team. I say we have an under sixteen team, and uh, we play 
typically at 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning. One of the big things I find with the kids is, say if they have their last meal, um, maybe it could be 8 o'clock at night, a lot of them get up as late as they can and come straight to the game without actually consuming breakfast, and a lot of them have the sports drink in, in their hand. Um, that would be a huge problem, I would say, for, uh, for kids. So I encourage them to get up uh, a few hours before the game and make sure they're properly yeah. fueled before they actually come down to play. Um, and I've, in terms of sports drinks, I think... I, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of them. Um, I never really drank to myself as a player. The only time I went for them would have been maybe at half time in a, in, in a championship game, but I never drank them pre, pre or post games. Um, and I worry about kids consuming them, obviously because the sugar content and the knock on effect that can have in their, terms of their body competition, but also their, their teeth as well. Yeah, I would completely agree. I would get your sports drinks out. I would say we don't want these. I would make sure that they have a breakfast and if they are training in the morning then you know something even a supper in the evening time they might have their dinner you know around five or six and then have nothing again until the next day so a supper night before and the other thing is encouraging them to be prepared to go to training sessions or traveling so a lunch box and, and putting together a couple of different things that they can put together very easily so the definite haves and then, you know, yes, there's a chocolate bar maybe or something else that's that, but only after you've done the first two or three things on there, which could be your water or milk, a yogurt, your sandwich or a bit of pasta, or so, especially if they're away for a blitz, you know, and then they're depending on, you don't know what you're depending on. So try and encourage that and be really tight on that one. And that, I think, eventually starts to, because they want to impress you as a coach as well. And if you're given out about that, you're probably given out about other things. But if they see that on the list, then they'll think, right, I better get Mac together about that. There's one over here. Just, just, just on that, can you be more specific on what you're talking about for breakfast? Because you say to the kids that they say, well, I had a bowl of cocoa pops. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and when you're talking about the lunchbox as well, you know, for adults as well, you know, like yeah. I play at 11 o'clock in the morning and I just have to leave at half eight. So what should you have in the lunchbox if you're well, like for like even I, well, I would encourage players to do what I would have done. I would, I would kind of cycle my intake based on the volume of training I would have been doing. So if if, if I was training hard one day, I would have, I would eating a higher volume of food that day, I would have taken in more calories that day. Equally, if I, if I was doing nothing that day or knew I wasn't going to be active, I would have reduced the amount I eat that day. Um, but in terms of breakfast, if I was you know, getting up to play a game at 11 o'clock, I always would have gone for, for porridge. Um, porridge with, with, I always drank full fat milk, I like the taste of it, <laughs> um, with fruit and maybe some eggs. That's what I always would have had for breakfast because I'm getting my carbohydrate source and also uh, my protein source for my eggs in terms of uh, growth and repair for, for post-game. Um, Wheat Vix is another good one, especially for kids. Um, you know, and then I think you've got to, we certainly try to steer them away from the Cocoa Pops, I fully agree with that, but it's where it's how you manage that and it probably is over time that you need to, to look at it. So um, you, a boiled egg, you know, some toast, um, a yogurt, some fruit, um, small combinations of, of all of the above. Um, and again, break time at school is really important as well, making sure they take something with them for their break too. Um, you can go down all the fancier routes, you know, mueslis, all of these types of things. I think we have to watch that some of these can be relatively high in sugar as well. So again, watching the, the salt and sugar content of our cereals. Porridge, listen, you can't beat it, but it's trying to encourage it with kids. Cinnamon sweetens things up without the effect of sugar, so it's maybe something that you can use. I try and steer away from honey because it does exactly the same thing. It's just a, this word natural. Cocaine's natural. I don't advocate that either. But so I think we have to think about what natural actually does mean. So we've one more question, I think. <laughs> one more question, lady at the back here. Vilified. Probably up to 10 a week, boiled, poached or scrambled. Again, trying to stay away from the, the fried, but yeah. And actually eggs is another really good source of iron, for especially with the yolk. So again, and what I've noticed slipping in is raw eggs. It has to be cooked.
Uh, for me, like like I said, on, on a say a non-training day where um, I maybe I wouldn't go for the carbohydrate source or a large car carbohydrate carbohydrate source in the morning. I'd go for eggs a lot. So if I know I'm not going to be hugely active that day, I'll have like a high protein breakfast, and eggs would always be the cornerstone of that. Okay, I think we're being given a sign from the back. Um, I'd let one more, one more. Is that okay? Pro that's an individual thing as well, but certainly for it to be available within the system, if you're going to have a bigger meal, it probably is at least an hour. If you go to the yogurt or milk and a bit of fruit, some of that will actually be in the system within. So again, it depends what you're eating. If you add a lot of fiber or fat to something, it slows the rate at which it gets into the system in. So again, keep your bigger meals within three to four hours and then your smaller snacks within an hour. Listen, Brian, thank you very much for your insight to um, the practical bits. And thank you very much. If you could fill in your, um, just your assessment form. And I'd like to thank the Dairy Council for this presentation today. Thank you.